Welcome to the She's a 10 Times 5 show with hosts Lori Jabbar and Michelle Emick. We're bringing public figures, subject matter experts, and other accomplished guests to the Studio 50 table to serve you up the best tips, tricks, and key takeaways that all us midlifers want to know about. Okay, time to join us for some Times 5 fun. Let's go. This week's guest is San Diego County District Attorney Summer Steffen. In this episode, Summer will lead us on a journey to give us the five important things we need to know as parents, aunts, uncles, community members about the epidemic with drugs. We'll talk about fentanyl. We'll talk about marijuana use. We'll talk about pills and opioids. This is a must listen to episode and one to share. Let's go. Hey, everyone. Welcome to She's a 10 times five. I am Lori and I got my friend Michelle here today. Hi, Lori. So glad to be here. Yeah. You know what? Singing Michelle needs to resurface. Oh, hello. Yes. Thank you. Because we like your Julia Child. I feel like I need to do a different one. I've got to come up with a better one. It is. Well, you know what? I, let's throw it back to Julia Child. She's iconic. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge, yeah, I'm a huge awesome. fan. You just okay. need curly hair and you'll be good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we've got, we started off light here, but we actually have a very heavy hitting guest in the San Diego District Attorney, Summer Stefan, coming into the studio with us. And this is a topic, Michelle, that we have wanted to dive into and learn more about for quite some time. It is the world and epidemic of drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, you know, there's so much information out there um, as parents. I mean, it, there, we've all kind of heard these stories of, you know, the fentanyl crisis and so forth. So to be able to bring someone on of her caliber and really educate us on what we need to know. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm honored that she's, that she's joining us and excited to, to listen in. Yeah. She's a busy woman and you know that this is an important topic when she can carve out time in her daily to, uh, to chop it up with us. So, all right, get ready. Let's go. Okay. We have one of my favorite, favorite people in studio 50 remotely. She's a superhero. She's about five foot, but she walks like she's nine feet tall. She's a sledgehammer in the San Diego community. Thank you so much, D.A. Summer Stefan, for being here. So great to be with you, uh, Lori and Michelle. Fantastic. Yeah. And I'm really excited because, you know, you and I had breakfast a beat ago and one, I mean, I was very interested in some of the things that you were working on um, because San Diego has a fairly large district attorney footprint. And we got into the topic of drugs, which was probably the 10th or 11th time within a month that us adults were talking about this epidemic. And you have graciously agreed to kind of take us down the path where you give us those five key points as to what we need to know as parents and community members on this subject. So I'm going to let you kind of take the floor here and go for it. Well, it's uh, definitely something that is affecting so many lives uh, across the U.S. and right here in San Diego County. Like you mentioned, we're the fifth largest county in the U.S. with 3.3 million people. And we also happen to be the largest entryway for fentanyl uh, to the United States. And what we're really talking about is an overdose epidemic but it is the entry of fentanyl that has been the game changer in a devastating way for families across the United States. Uh, Last year, we surpassed 100,000 people dying from fentanyl. And that is just a tragic figure, but when you stop and really pause and think about that, it is the number one cause of death for people 18 to 45 years old. That's people like in the prime of their life. 
and they are dying from fentanyl as the leading cause, about 40,000. It's a staggering number. And when you compare it to everything else that could kill young people, like car accidents, homicide, suicide, nothing compares. It's more like in the 20,000. COVID, not even anywhere in the realm of killing young people from fentanyl. So this is a conversation that we have to have today. And it's a conversation that is affecting our families and kids. And I would say, number one is to not think about it as someone else's problem. And no, really, no family is immune. And I've had the the grace and the privilege of meeting with all sorts of families, you know, rich and poor from every sector, families that thought everything was going great with their kids, and it was until that fentanyl entered the picture. Yeah. To, to clarify, I, I think a lot of people understand the fentanyl thing, but if you could explain for those that don't how it gets kind of integrated into normal street drugs or, you know, opioids and those types of things. So fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. So we, we think about, uh, you know, drugs and drug overdoses in terms of stimulants like methamphetamine, cocaine, or like heroin or the opioid epidemic, like the Oxycontin and Percocet medications. Well, fentanyl is a synthetic opioid. That means it's just made synthetically. It's not a plant like the poppy flower. And because of that, it can be made such that two milligrams, that's just like a sprinkle of salt over your food, can kill a human being. Two milligrams, you can barely see two milligrams. And it's mostly made by the cartels in Mexico in basically just buckets where they put fentanyl, put a whole bunch of junk, and then they have pill presses that make it look like it's a Xanax pill, an Oxycontin pill, a Percocet pill, Adderall, or they can mix it into powders like methamphetamine or cocaine or heroin. So it comes in pill or powder form. But when it actually is poisonous and it deceives the buyers is when it just looks like a legitimate pharmaceutical pill. So my number one tip to everybody, the number one thing is that there is absolutely nothing out there that you are getting not from your doctor or legitimate pharmacy, whether you're buying it online or from a person that doesn't contain fentanyl. The good chance is that fentanyl is in whatever looks legitimate so long as it doesn't come from your doctor or pharmacy. And this is why it has been a game changer in terms of being more of a poison. When I talk to families, they don't even like the word overdose. They believe it's a poison, and I do too, because it is, it is basically a decoy, an arsenic, a poison posing as something else. Yeah. Well, two things that I mean, I love that you just said that because I'll give you two scenarios. If you have a college kid, these college kids think they're invincible and it's very common for them to walk down the hallway in their dorm room and take someone else's Adderall because they got a big test. And, you know, you have to have that conversation immediately, like never, ever take anyone else's if you don't know where the source is. And secondly, I was thinking about this because we were in an airport coming back from Puerto Vallarta and throughout the airport, there are pharmacies and people go in and they buy Xanax and they buy pain medication and, you know, Valtrex and all the things that we can't get over the counter here in the U S. And I was thinking to myself, you have to be absolutely nuts to be doing that right now. Correct. 
You're absolutely right. And of course, there was a, a test or an investigation done on some of our pharmacies in Mexico, because we have a lot of binational populations here uh, in San Diego County, and many of them had fentanyl, tested for fentanyl. Now, these were some of the smaller pharmacies, not the big ones that, you know, are certified, licensed, that we're aware of, but there were plenty of them that sure looked legitimate with a pharmacist and a pharmacy name, but they still contain fentanyl. Fentanyl is so cheap. And what we know about drug dealing is that it's all about making money. And if you can get something that you can make for two cents and you're making $50 a pill, your profit margin uh, makes you where you don't care. You're going to put it in everything possible. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, I'm speechless. Real. I know. Yeah. I know. It's like, it's, it's so much to take in. I'm, I'm hanging on every word and it's scary and heartbreaking and, and, but we yep. need to hear this. We need to know, I mean, especially for anyone, not just the children, but everyone. Absolutely everyone. I mean, the average age of death is still in the 30s. So this is why I'd say, and I'm so glad, uh, Lori, you mentioned this college kids, is this is a time where knowledge is power and conversations are really important. And it's just bringing the conversation without shame, without blame, but simply saying, even if you trust your roommate, you trust the next door roommate, and you have a test that you're staying up for, and you're going to go and get their Adderall, or get, um, you've got a pain in your shoulder, you played a tough soccer game, and you want to be up for your game the next day, so you want to take a Percocet, and you don't have time to go to the doctor. The thing is, you may trust your neighbor, your roommate, but you don't actually know where they got it from. And what I tell people is we've done tests with the DEA and you have a pill that is stamped and it looks just like an M30 blue mm -hmm. uh, pill that you're familiar with after your sports injury that almost everybody's taken at some point. And one person could take one side of that pill and be fine. Another person could take the other side of that pill and die of an overdose. Why? It's because when these cartels, this organized crime mixes this, think of a chocolate chip cookie, how there isn't an even number of chocolate chips all around. The fentanyl is also not even. So your roommate might have taken that pill and survived, but the next pill in the bottle may have too much fentanyl and it's going to kill you. Or even one side, we've seen two people where paramedics respond, same pill split between two people, one dies, one lives. It's because this isn't a pharmacy and a doctor. It's just an operation to make as much of these infected pills and powders as possible to make as much money as possible. This is why my number one tip is no families immune. There are no bad children. Everybody out there is susceptible. We all have issues, you know, different challenges and we're trying to get a quick fix. And so the conversation today is about there is no such thing as an experiment anymore. Experimentation today with fentanyl flooding our markets is really can be a death sentence. We have to have these conversations. And the way that I my tip for when parents talk to kids is not to talk to them as if this is something that your kid is going to do but more about having your kid be an ambassador of knowledge so they can help their friends to make sure their friends, their, their loved ones are safe, their roommates are safe. So kind of imparting that knowledge in a non-judgmental way so that 
they can be the ambassador of safety for their group. Yeah. Well, and I think we've become so pill driven. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was growing up, and I don't know if you and Michelle feel the same way, Summer, but people didn't take pills. Like Xanax wasn't a thing, you know, opioids weren't a thing. Um, and now I think it's such a socially accepted thing that you're medicated. And, you know, and I think, and, and couple that with like, let's say, you know, you're a fraternity or sorority person and you're at a party and maybe you've had a couple cocktails. Well, then you've lost your judgment, your sense of judgment, and you're not thinking clearly through this. But the pills stuff really bothers me because I think kids are very desensitized to how serious it can be to be on that kind of medication and not do it right. That, that's right. I mean, I think pills just lower our, our sort of safety system. They, they feel like there's something that's a medication. I was talking to a police officer uh, the other day, just last week, who lost his daughter and, um, you know, to something that she thought was a pill and it was, you know, she had a kid and now he's raising that kid. And of course, he's happy to do it. But it was this kind of judgment uh, piece that was about um, rushing and not taking the time to make an appointment, even as people are suffering. And we know that, uh, especially kids coming out of COVID and all of that and all the disruption in society and life that has happened, that mental health issues, isolation, depression are real things um, across our nation. And a quick fix may feel like a pill to numb the pain, to numb the anxiety. And, but that quick fix is really very likely, if it's not coming from your doctor, to contain fentanyl and, and sadly be the last thing that, that people do. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you this, and you, you may intend on talking about this, so sorry if I've, I've jumped the broom here. Um, let's talk weed. And Michelle, you're in Florida, California. It's, it's just every, yeah, it's everywhere. Has that caused anything unique um, as far as drug usage? Well, I mean, there there has been not a lot, but a couple of uh, reported cases where fentanyl was even in what people thought was uh, marijuana. So it can it can be there. But the number one thing is there is absolutely um, no question that the prevalence and increase since the legalization of marijuana, the increase in kids using marijuana in that, you know, kids will, will tell their parents it's harmless, it's legal, um, you know, it's safer than alcohol. They will. Yeah, I've, I've gotten that one. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of slogans about it. But what we know, no matter how you feel about marijuana for adults, what is clear, absolutely crystal clear from the research and the studies is that it is really destructive to developing brains, to young brains, to the central system in your brain that controls judgment and controls motivation and all the other things that it has a disproportionate negative impact on young people. Um, so, so it has that negative impact. There's also no question that there is a very legitimate studies that are coming out that um, marijuana is producing, especially when people begin using it at a young age and persistently use it, that it has been linked to many psychotic disorders. Um, Radies Children's Hospital tells us that they've never seen, that's our our local children's hospital, uh, they've never seen the number of young people with psychotic breakdowns. And when you look at many of them, you do see uh, persistent use of uh, marijuana, which has these days a very high THC level, not, not the same as, you know, the, the 60s weed. So, 
So it is a serious issue. And the third thing we know for a fact is that no matter what people tell you, uh, it is a gateway drug. We have a study that we do on all of our arrestees that get arrested. And when you, when you, you go through that and you see that in their system they have uh, heroin or they have fentanyl or they have cocaine or methamphetamine, oftentimes alongside it is marijuana. And when, you, when the researchers talk to them, they tell you that this is where they began their journey. Well, the other thing, too, is, um, I mean, it's been proven to be addictive. You know, I think that it's kind of skated through the gateway of um, it not being an addictive substance. You know, it's not like cocaine or heroin. But I think now studies have come out saying that it, in many cases, is 100% addictive. And just like you said, a gateway drug where you start to escalate. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, and we really need to emphasize with with our kids, there is this feeling, and it's almost a feeling that you know drug dealers want kids to have, is that everybody uses like it's not normal not to use, but the reality is that a still a small percentage of young people use illicit substances and including marijuana a higher number use marijuana than other uh, drugs, but it's still not the majority, not even close. But the feeling that kids, you know, it's almost like drug dealers are winning because we're leaving the impression that it's not normal to not use. Yeah, so much through social media, just media in general, television, movies, everything is, they're glorifying it in a lot of ways. They are, they are glorifying it and, and making it seem like the norm. Uh, and this is why we do have to, and this was going to be my, my second tip, you know, the, the first one was that everything is pretty much pill or powder that's not from your pharmacy it has fentanyl. But another one was that uh, social media is really irresponsible. In fact, many of the cases that we deal with where sadly parents are finding young kids, you know, as young as 13, we lost 12 kids under the age of 18 in San Diego County to fentanyl. It's been the social media. Your drug dealer doesn't look like your drug dealer. You don't have to go out on the corner in a scary neighborhood to buy drugs. You can just go online. You have the disappearing uh, social media, Snapchat, and and other avenues where there's emojis that represent what you're going to buy. And of course, the, the social media companies tell you that they can't control it, but we know they have algorithms that if they focused on controlling it and updating it, they would be able to help us prevent it. So there is a response. Or at least make it harder, there. right? absolutely make it harder. Maybe one or two will slip by, but right now it's a free for all. And, you know, we're used to doing everything on social media. So this again, lowers, lowers the inhibitions and allows kids to, to normalize it and to think, Hey, I can get this online. It's not a scary drug dealer. It's just something that is posing like an online pharmacist that's selling me this stuff. So that's, that's another big tip. And another one is just to, to have kids practice saying no in a, in a kind of not confrontational manner, but just no, you know, I've got something the next day or my coach is going to, you know, my parents are going to lock my phone forever, whatever language. And to always have a safe word with your kids so that they can call you uh, and you can pick them up without making a big deal, without making it look like um, outing them essentially in front of their friends. So, so these are conversations that we have to have ahead of time. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting you say the safe word because I, with my two boys, if they were to do sleepovers or go to a, a social gathering, um, it was their stomach hurt. So if they called me and said their stomach hurt, then I knew, okay, I got to go get them, you know? 
That's perfect. That's that's perfect. It it's just having it's very it's much easier for kids to resist, you know, because at these parties that sometimes they, they'll do a kind of a pills that they'll throw in the middle of the table. They're all mixed together and you're taking any kind of pill. You don't know what you're taking, allowing your kid the grace of being able to quietly text you that word and then you call them. So it looks like they didn't initiate leaving. You initiated because grandma's sick or whatever is happening, the pickup. And well, that's you a great idea. So, so it's just creating that conversation ahead of time. And then, of course, always telling your kids that, that, you know, they can talk to you about anything. You'd be surprised that sometimes they will uh, re with repeating that conversation and, be, and really being able to keep their secrets when they share them with you. Yeah. Boy, Michelle, are you getting scared? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, no, I, I mean, it's just, this is just information you need to know. I, it, it's hard not to just think about just how accessible everything is. And these yeah. kids are, you know, I trying to remember back when we were at that age, you know, and just, you just think you're invincible. I think you mentioned that Lori. And so um, it just, I, I think setting up exactly what you said is setting up those those steps that the kids have an outlet to be able to say, Hey, I've got a safe word, or whatever that might be. Um, how important that is. And these conversations have to take place. They have to. Yeah. That's you know absolutely what? right. That, that is right. The conversation has to take place and they do take a hold. It's kind of talking with your kids and, um, and not threatening to take their phone away because the, the kids just, this is like terror for them taking their phone away. So they won't share with you anything, no matter what it is, kind of explaining that you're going to help them make their phone safe. If somebody's trying to seduce them into, you know, t taking drugs or doing other exploitative things is being able to have the conversation about their phones, making their phones safe, as opposed to making their phones and their social media disappear. It's that balance and keeping the conversation going, but understanding that, you know, there's, there's no such thing as perfect kids. Um, all, all our kids are perfect and have a future, you know, they, and they deserve a future. And so it's, it's realizing that none of us are immune and we have to have these conversations because Fentanyl is really a game changer. Yeah. Well, the other thing that I think is so important is um, we as parents or adults um, need to share information too and uh, not be afraid to, you know, kind of share your story about maybe something that happened with your own child or, or yourself. And I think, you know, we're just in that kind of time frame where I think we all need to know the information and not be in denial exactly like what you said is that it can th certain things can happen to anybody yeah, and not being naive too I think yeah. we've, we've had this conversation before and parents need to be they can't be oh that wouldn't be my you know that's yeah. not my kid like he would never do drugs or this and that well they they probably would um, there's a lot well, of peer pressure it's never you, it's there. never going to be your kid till it is your kid yeah. right never yeah. be till it is yep yeah yeah, I mean, it is the JAMA uh, study on pediatrics I and mean, showed uh, the really big increase in overdose deaths that were accidental. It's not kids trying to take their life. It's because fentanyl is so, so potent that it is, again, it has changed the rules and the days of experimentation are really gone. And this is why I want to emphasize that, you know, maybe... Uh, you know, sky jumping or another form of experimentation, but really not pills or powders, not today, not until we can eradicate uh, how prevalent it is in the market right now. It's a great point. Yeah. It seems so simple, right? But yeah, it's not really not. Pickleball, pickleball is the answer, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what other items do you have that we need to know about summer 
Well, this is a little bit controversial, but I, I do recommend that every household have naloxone or the street name is Narcan, which oh, yeah. reverses an opioid uh, overdose and is, is really life-saving. It's even safe, the doctors tell us, for pregnant women and for, infant, for, for children over the age of six months. So it is, it is not a drug in itself. It reverses the opioid overdose and gives you enough time to get uh, your loved one to a hospital. Now, some, sometimes the controversy is that, you know, you don't want to um, basically make it seem like it's okay to use because we're going to reverse it and save your life. But it's just like you don't want a fire, but you still have a fire extinguisher. You're not going to start a fire just to put it out and, and test out your fire extinguisher, but you want to still have that, whether you display it in the open or you have it somewhere and it's so easy to use, but it has created so many opportunities for life saving with enough time to then seek treatment, especially, especially if you think your family member is experimenting or is addicted. Um, you know, again, uh, addiction uh, is treatable. I've seen so many People grow up to be doctors and lawyers who went through deep addiction phases. Um, there is treatment. So, you know, we shouldn't shame treatment. We should allow people a chance to be treated just like for diabetes or anything else. But I would recommend for really any family, not just families that have um, addiction uh, worries, in their family to have Narcan and to know how to use it. Um, I also would say that um, when you talk to kids, use a health language because kids are smart and they really, uh, really absorb health information. They wanna be healthy. We're in a generation of, of health and trying to enhance health. So talk about drugs and talk about staying safe using kind of a health language as opposed to like a shaming, this is bad language. All the studies tell us that works a little bit better. Yeah. Can you explain where to get that? So most, um, <laughs> it doesn't need a prescription anymore. So you can get it from any pharmacy and you don't have to like, have a reason like you have uh, an addiction or, or anything like that because it is so safe for use it's now become readily available and most counties if you google them they'll have their county health agency will give it to you for free but most pharmacies will sell it to you well i was just going to say I, i've heard of narcan but i wasn't familiar with the purpose of what it did, what it did. And, um, that was just a, that was, that's great information to have. Um, and I don't think it's something that maybe individuals wouldn't think, think of, but it could save your life. Narcan definitely can save and has saved many lives. All paramedics now carry it, police carries it, but sometimes that's too late by the time they arrive. And that's why having it on hand, most schools now have their teachers training to use it and have it there. And it's simply a nasal spray. There's injection form, but the professionals can use that. But it's just a nasal spray where you you it's, it's pretty self-explanatory where you put it in each nostril um, after. So most of the time, if you see um, somebody, you walk into a room and there's somebody that's making gurgling noises, they have a little bit of a blue tinge on their lips, uh, or if they have darker skin, a little bit of a gray tinge. Um, if they have, um, they're, they're kind of looking like they're grasping for breath. If you call out something, loud and they don't wake up, you rub their sternum, they don't wake up, then the best thing to do is call 911 and use the Narcan until your 911 arrives. The nice thing about it is what the doctors tell us in all the studies, if it turns out to be something else, 
it won't hurt them. Okay. Let's say it's a gotcha. stroke or a heart mm -hmm. attack. You still want to try to open an airway, do your normal CPR, but it won't interfere with it to go ahead and use the Narcan, especially, obviously, if you see pills inside or anything that would indicate um, use of, of a substance that may have contained fentanyl or an opioid. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah. No, it's great. I was just thinking of especially like the college campuses and so forth. Hopefully they have those. <clears throat> Many uh, of them do. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I think it's like everything that's difficult is we have to keep talking about it. And, and we know that talking about it, in addition to obviously law enforcement and prosecutors like my office have to go after the drug dealers. We prosecuted 503 of them. Last year, we did <laughs> seven murder cases for those who sold fentanyl knowing it's a killer, but they're continuing to sell it to the next person it's clear that they're they don't care about murdering you know human beings right and and so we're doing our part but what we need is for everyone to set aside all these notions of this can't happen to me and instead let's look out for each other let's have these conversations with everyone like today everyone that you know that have this conversation did you hear about fentanyl and what it's doing do you know that it can be in any pill that looks absolutely familiar like an oxy percocet adderall xanax um do you know that it killed over a hundred thousand people do you know it's the number one killer of young people um have you thought about uh, do you happen to have narcan in your house i'm thinking about getting it uh, basically having these everyday conversations. This is how we empower ourselves and our community to fight this big monster because it's just not going to be enough for us to find every single drug dealer and go after them. Because after all, your drug dealer is on your social media. They're your friend, they're your neighbor, they're your roommate in a, in a college dorm. And so we need people to be empowered with this knowledge amen to that yeah thank you that that summed it up there and that was amazing thank you so much for just educating us on this i think people have had different conversations but this really hit home with some facts and some key takeaways of things that we can do and implement immediately to make an impact and make a difference yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. Thank you, Lori. This has been a great opportunity. It just hurts my heart every time I look in the eyes of a parent that lost a beautiful son or daughter, and they just wonder, you know, what could they have done? And, you know, all of us are doing the best that we can do, um, but you've got this element of greedy, organized crime and cartels that keep selling us stronger and stronger drugs, more and more potent. And we really need to build a generation that understands that there are so many natural highs uh, in the world and that um, it's becoming more and more dangerous to experiment. If you had a microphone, I would say drop it right now. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you listeners. Thank you.